Namaste, hello, and welcome to Gaia Ayurveda, reconnecting with nature through Ayurveda. I'm Fern Hills, an Ayurvedic practitioner, herbal yogi, and holistic health coach. Gaia Ayurveda is a holistic health community with an aim to guide and empower you on your healing journey. This YouTube channel aims to share earth wisdom, nature intuition, and five element healing based on the ancient science of Ayurveda. Listen to our interviews with inspiring guests on topics from health, nutrition, and herbalism to yoga, meditation, and psychology. We discuss root cause healing, natural detoxing, and all things related to high vibrational health and body, mind, soul balance. Each episode is available on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast apps. Further information and details shared in the video can be found in the video description as well as links to sign up to my weekly newsletter on Ayurveda, herbalism, nutrition and natural detoxing with medicinals. So sit back and relax with your herbal infusion and let's jump right in to this week's conversation. So hi guys, welcome back to Gaia Ayurveda. I'm so happy to have everyone back with us. And in this episode, we're talking to Rishi from MeditateWithRishi.com. Rishi is a meditation teacher and coach, and he's been teaching meditation and coaching for the past four years, and he's been living in India to further his meditation knowledge and practice. Rishi started his journey into the practice of meditation after working in the corporate sector in London for over eight years. And in this episode, we're talking with Rishi about the fundamentals of meditation and really how meditation can help us not only to calm the mind, but also to improve your health and relationships, as well as heal from our past wounds. So before we dive in, don't forget to subscribe and stay tuned to more episodes from Gaia Ayurveda. But now let's connect with Rishi. So hello everyone, welcome back to Gaia Ayurveda. So today we're talking with Rishi, who is a meditation teacher and coach, and he has been teaching for over four years now. So welcome Rishi, thank you for coming on Gaia Ayurveda and speaking with us today. Thank you, thanks for having me. Namaste. Namaste. So um, if you'd just like to maybe explain a little bit about yourself and, and how you came across meditation. Yes, okay. Uh, shall I shall I tell you my the, the backstory in terms of how I got into it, um, so that the audience has a bit of uh, yes, that would be um, very, that would be great co- context yeah. context. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because that because I, I wasn't I wasn't always um, a meditation teacher. As Fern said, this is something quite um, more recent three three four years is when I started getting into learning and teaching meditation. So I'll speak a bit about how I got into it because I think for the audience trying to solve any problems for themselves i feel like that's what they likely will want to know okay so the highlights are that i grew up in in kenya okay uh, i grew up in so so my parents were divorced um so childhood was it wasn't all bad but it definitely had it, its parts of uh, um you know fights and and a bit of traumatic stuff uh, so that that was there in childhood and then when I was 18, I went to university um, in the UK. And um, when I finished university, that year was quite, so I, I lost both my parents in, in that year. Um, they both had you know, a similar disease. And um, so that, that was quite a big shock you know, to someone who's just been enjoying themselves in university, partying, all these things. <laughs> and, and for that to happen, it was, definitely a big a big shock on on many levels um emotional financial like just the whole you feel like your support system has has you know gone Mm -hmm. um so with with blessings and grace and and all these things i managed to to get through it uh you know like i started working in london and started kind of getting on my feet and and doing doing okay so there was no problem on that front but in hindsight i feel like there was a lot of unprocessed emotions, right? With with that childhood and with the, mm-hmm. the losing my parents at that at that point. So, like most people, I was running away from <laughs> those emotions without knowing I'm running away from them, right? So this is when, uh, like, partying became quite excessive. You know, uh, that that standard like work hard, play hard lifestyle of like working in a week and then like partying on the weekends. Um, being hungover most weekends, uh, that started becoming excessive. Okay, so um, it got excessive to a point where 
I did not like it. Like I didn't like who I was becoming as as a person. Um, I kind of felt like, okay, this is a bit extreme. This is not who, you know, my pa- this is not what my parents would have wanted. Uh, mm-hmm. Essentially, this is not what they sacrificed for, and and all these things. So this desire for change started coming around um, a few, like five or six years into that whole lifestyle. So around 2016 time, I decided that I, I want to change. And I tried, you know, many things. Uh, so so getting into fitness was one of them. And then luckily, like I, I feel like this is, this definitely comes from from blessings and, and grace, right? So I remembered at the time that when I was a child, when I, when I was a kid, my granddad used to have me sit with him in the home temple and uh, practice. So meditation or mantra, mantra chanting, that was a practice that we used to do. And I thought to myself, why not? Why not start doing that again in the mornings? You know, maybe it'll, it'll make me feel better. So that's kind of that's that was the first seed of, of this entire journey, um, because I started doing that and I started liking it, enjoying it quite a bit. And slowly, slowly. Uh, it definitely brought about some changes in me. Um, so much so that in 2018, I was able to kind of, you know, like like have a year, um, almost a full year off alcohol. And uh, my kind of, you know, quit, like quitting those habits started becoming something quite real that, okay, I can, I can quit all of that and live a much better life that where, where I'm happy with what I'm doing, kind of, kind of follow my heart and, and be proud of myself. So, Long story, to, to, to kind of, you know, sum, sum this up in terms of how I got into meditation. After all the changes I saw in myself, purely with regards to habit change, I was, I was like, wow, meditation is, is powerful, right? Someone like me, who <laughs> was, was quite extreme, was able to change just through this one practice and so nothing else, right? None of the traditional stuff, not like no going to therapy or speaking to anyone or, um, none of that just just purely through meditation so this is when i thought that this is incredible um i i love this practice so much and i love studying about these topics so much that i want to i would like to teach it if i can i'd like to share this with other people um but also i was mindful that i like, i can't start teaching teaching just like that right just because you you know how to do one practice or a little bit um so i decided to go to india to start learning about different types of meditation and see what I can do to, um, to, to explore my own spirituality, um, you know, really learn and trying to find, just quench that thirst, that, that curiosity that was in me um, and, and hopefully learn enough to, to actually to start teaching as well. So 2019 is when I, I head off to India um, and I, I started studying there. And then I started, uh, uh, like after getting certified, I started teaching. But since then, the journey has been, so initially it was habit change um, where meditation was helping me. But after that, you know, all that, those, those emotions that I had not dealt with, uh, relationships that were kind of causing me trouble, I started working on all of that stuff with meditation and uh, not just meditation, just learning the, the, the philosophies and the practices like, you know, yoga and especially the Buddhist teachings, the, the teachings of the Buddha. That's something I've um you know studied studied like I, I love studying I'm, I'm an absolute beginner but I love studying that um and even attending teachings from the Dalai Lama himself <laughs> so that's um, that's how I I got into everything um I hope that answers the yes the thank question. you that's super interesting thank you for that in-depth and um story and for opening and sharing much of your heart because I know I think a lot of us in this modern time, we're becoming aware that trauma is a thing that many of us, and if not all of us, has been through being in this lifetime or multi-generational. I know myself um, growing up in the UK, um, I also in the family went through trauma as a child. And um, I think my nervous system, I got into a state where this stress anxiety was so present in my life and um, through Ayurveda, actually, and also meditation and yoga, these tools, um, these holistic tools really helped me to to manage my stress, to manage my anxiety. Um, also, uh, with a history of some alcoholism in the family, I also got to a point where I felt very pressured in society to drink and among my peers. And finally, when I got kind of enough internal strength and courage to 
to counter that, I realized how alcohol and and other substances were also uh, impacting on my men on on me on my mind on my emotions uh, in terms of depression anxiety and it was so funny to me I remember I did I did go to counseling a little bit um, before when I was younger and I remember being so surprised that no one asked me oh are you drinking and and how much do you drink and and no one actually in terms of uh, the health providers kind of gave me that connection or even posed that question and when I really went into that and I learned through Ayurveda and how these different energies as well on based on our lifestyle, the things we put in our body, the food, sattvagajas, tamas, um, can affect your mind, your emotions, your well-being. Um, I really, it was a, a bit of a light bulb moment for me. Wow, I can also manage my emotions uh, through also what the things I put in my body and how I live my life. So thank you for sharing that. Um, yep. It's very interesting to the listeners. Mm. And I thought you wanted to comment. And, on and yeah, I... I yeah, I, I do. I do agree with with what you're saying. It, it's the it's the classic um, situation of ba- a band aid solution to things versus addressing the root cause of of problems. And I feel like we were speaking about this yesterday. That this is where um, the, the modern science and the ancient traditions, you know, coming together is extremely powerful because the the ancient traditions like Ayurveda or yoga. Um, are very much about root cause, you know, even with even with suffering, um, our human suffering, you know, it's not about it, it's it's the Buddha went straight to the root cause, right? You you if you if you we, we can identify and completely like eliminate the root cause of suffering, then everything else is 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 gone, you know. <laughs> uh so yeah, root cause is really important. Um so I, I think I think that's something that more people should be aware of. Um, and that comes through education, which is why we're we're even, we're doing this this podcast. Thank you. So, based on that, if you could um, maybe talk a little bit about pain and suffering, because and later we'll discuss um, how meditation can benefit us or help us as a tool in terms of other, let's say, so called unwanted emotions like stress, anxiety, fear, and things. But just since you've touched upon pain and suffering, um, maybe you could just explain a little bit how. Uh, the relationship between meditation, pain, and suffering, and also that's something that very much the Buddha taught in his teachings. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll go. We'll go. We'll go step by step, right? If I if we explain this in in really simple and practical terms, right? Um, the the suffering that we speak about, like you mentioned, negative emotions, um, th- this type of stuff. It, fundamentally, it's all in in our mind. Our mind is where we experience the world. Right. So any kind of happiness we experience, it's because of the mind. Any pain or suffering we experience, again, it's because of, of the mind. Right. So that the mind is where all of it is happening. Now, the funny thing is that the way <laughs> that the way nature has has made us is that for some reason we are not really in control of our mind and our thoughts and our emotions. Right, the, the mind is <laughs> it, it's it's somehow stronger, you know, the, the monkey mind, what what we call. Um, this is kind of the this is kind of the game of life, right? Where you have this mind, this mind that the mind, by the way, is, is you know more powerful than any supercomputer that can ever be devised, right? Because even the the foundation of the super, supercomputer will come from <laughs> will come from the mind. Um, so it's so powerful, it's so powerful, but we don't know how to use it. We don't. We've never been given a manual of of how to use it uh, in in a in a good way, right? So, a traditional example given is if you have a knife, right? With, with a knife, you can do two things. You can, if you don't use it well, you can kill someone. Um, but in the hands of a surgeon, a scalpel can save a life, right? So it's the the mind. It's it's a tool essentially. So we need to know how to use it. So meditation, in really simple terms we can say is training the mind, um, any any kind of practice or training that we do to regain control of our thoughts, our emotions, um, reconnecting to our awareness. Um, that's that's meditation, right? Which is to give you a, to, to take it in the right direction, in a positive direction, so that our experience of life uh, becomes positive. Um, and that's as simple as it is. And I would go as far as saying that if one knows how to do this, then 
you don't need, besides basic necessities like food, clothing, and shelter, you don't need any of the things that society has conditioned us to believe we need to be happy, right? So you don't need um, all the things that we know, right? The, the the flashy cars and houses and all. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying it's not needed to be happy. Um, yet we spend a lot of our lives grinding away to to get those things. <laughs> and and the people who have them, you know, are, are they're telling us that actually this is not, a cause of happiness. Um, but yeah, coming back to the main point, meditation is a way of training the mind um, that, that will lead us to a better experience of life, more happiness, peace, compassion, kindness, all the good qualities that we want to cultivate. They're already inside us. We just need to, to train the mind in that way. Um, and that's what these traditions teach us, um, yoga, Buddhist teachings, all of this. Wow, that's so interesting. Thank you for sharing. Because And some of the points you touched upon know of this um the mind sometimes taking us out of ourselves or us not being in control of it. I know through Ayurveda and what I've learned through yogic theory as well, um, and what they teach us in the schools of thought of meditation in, in Buddhism, is this attachment to the outside, as you said, is is kind of the cause of suffering. These things that we we think we run after thinking, oh, if I have more money or if I have a bigger house or if I have this car or if I have new clothes or if I if I just can attain this one thing outside of me then I will finally be happy um and I know that meditation for me has helped me realize this disattach from these things be able to observe and witness them as external to me and know that that's not necessarily going to make me happy and um and so it would be really great because I know we touched upon this in when we've spoken before, but at the uh, you did speak about um, also because we've spoken a briefly a bit about what meditation is and kind of some of the benefits and how they've helped you, but also some of these qualities that we can harness within us, as you spoke about compassion, loving kindness. If you could speak a little bit about that and how meditation because I think lots of people perhaps think that meditation is just um, stopping our thoughts. Whereas I think this is maybe a, um, um, a misunderstanding because it's, it's not necessarily very easy to just stop our thoughts, <laughs> but there's meditation within yeah. it. There's a whole world of different type of meditation and, and kind of this present moment consciousness that we can tap into to help us. So uh, you want me to speak a, a bit about the the inner qualities or the natural qualities? Yes, um, I mean, the other day you spoke about um, how these qualities we find through meditation and through presence, which I found um, really special. Yeah, and, and also demystifying what meditation is, um, that it's not just blanking the mind, right? Yes, yes, if yeah. you can explain a little okay. bit, yes, about meditation and, te and some techniques perhaps. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll do that as, as two questions. I'll, I'll speak about meditation first, because I think this is a, a good way to just demystify this for people. Um, because I, I've, I've been there myself, you know, when, when I initially used to hear the word meditation, uh, it, it sounded like this, this unreachable thing that I, I don't know what to do. You know, it's, these these people are meditating. They clearly know what's going on. I I don't know if if I'm doing it right, right? And um, so I think it's important to, to know what it is. Okay, so let's just simplify it completely. Hmm. Um, and I want I want to share this analogy with you, um, which it, which will I think stick in in people's minds. Uh, so the analogy was given by by a Buddhist master is that we compare our mind to a cassette tape. Okay, you remember the. The cassette tapes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we compare mm -hmm. the mind. We co compare the mind to a cassette tape, right? So, w with a cassette tape, there's two things that we are trying to be mindful of, right? One is the volume of the tape when it's playing, yeah. So in a car, you turn up the volume, turn it down. Um, so if it's too loud, then you don't feel good. You want it at a, a good, decent amount, right? So this is referring to the number of thoughts that are coming up. You know, how, how active is the mind? People say, I had this, you know, too much, like overactive mind, monkey mind. Um, so that's, yeah, cassette tape, the, the volume. Yeah, we're concerned with the volume. How many thoughts are there? How active is my mind? And then the second part of the cassette tape is what's actually playing? What song is playing? You know, is it is it a beautiful, uh, harmonious song? 
or is it something where like a bunch of people are swearing um, and and it's it's giving you like bad bad feelings, right? So content of the cassette tape, volume of the cassette tape, okay? Uh, with a mind, that's basically the how active is it, and what are the thoughts that are coming? You know, are the thoughts that you're carrying around? Um, you know, what are people going to think of me? Am I good enough? How, how do I look today? Or why is that person, you know, so successful and I'm not? Why is that person so beautiful and I'm not? You know, is are these the thoughts that we're carrying? Um, or are we carrying thoughts like, wow, like I'm 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 so blessed to have just a roof over my head, you know, food to eat and and a few people that I love, which a, a large percentage of the world don't have. They, you know, so many people don't don't have these basic things, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and it's a different view completely of the world, a different view completely. Anyway, coming back to the, the initial thing, right? So the we're, we're concerned about how active the mind is and what is the content of the mind, okay? So when we bring this to meditation, um, initially when people hear about meditation, they are they hear about the reducing the volume of the thoughts, so calming practices, right? Meditation will relax you, it will calm the mind, it will de-stress you, et cetera. This is where... You know, techniques like simple things, you know, watching the breath, um, breath awareness, body scans, um, uh, listening to sounds, all, all of this, all of this comes in, right? So I think a lot of people with the apps that are out there today are familiar with, with these kind of, of practices. So that's meditation in one way, which is using a practice to just calm the mind and bring it back to center. Um, bring it back to concentration and one pointedness as opposed to being scattered. Okay. So, any practice that allows you to do this, um, fo it's just focusing on one thing, uh, either a neutral thing like the breath or a positive thing like a mantra or a visual or a tree or a flower, anything, right? This is all, all concentrative uh, meditation. So, most people are familiar with this. So, that's, that's one part of meditation. But once you start doing that and you have a control over um, kind of where your mind is, and yeah, th that's, that's a big thing, by the way. Like when, when I was struggling with quitting drinking, um, that's what I didn't have. I didn't have that control. So mm -hmm. if this thought comes that, you know, let's, let's, go and, let's go and drink, right? Then do you just follow that? Like, like you have no control? Or do you identify that, hold on, that's just a thought. Um, I can decide where I want my mind to be that, okay, no, instead I'm, I want to go home and, and cook and, you know, read that you can decide, like it's your mind, you have the power to decide, but we forget, we forget we have that power and the mind generates these thoughts and we just carried away, carried away by them. So these initial meditations are really good at us gaining some kind of control over our um, mind and, and our awareness, right? So it's, uh, it's kind of like, on one side is a monkey and the other side is is you like the the inner you and you are trying to essentially strengthen yourself and tell the monkey that no you know i'm i'm in control i'm in the driver's seat i'm going to direct where we're going okay so that's that's one type of, of meditation then the other one is to do with the content the content of the mind this is huge right so we spoke about trauma um it, it could be anything like you know if you've lived life if let's say you're 30 years old so for the last 30 years things have happened in your life, all your experiences have actually gone into your mind stream as impressions and they stay there. You know, kind of like how if you throw stuff into the ocean, it just goes and rests like at, at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Just like that. Yeah, just like that. So there is so much there. And this is where kind of from that bed, this is where our, our thoughts are are coming up. This is how we, we view the world and, and we see the world, okay? So if, if the stuff there... In, in the in the subconscious is not serving you if it's not if it's not good stuff that's there <laughs> if the tape is playing bad music then we need to we need to re-record on that tape we need to change the content of that tape essentially okay so here the meditation is essentially just creating a new kind of conditioning and and way of thinking uh new views new ways of looking at the world right um Great. So jealousy. We're speaking about jealousy and how how normal it is in in this in this day and age. 
normal, it's always been normal, how easy it is to become jealous right now because you have Instagram, right? So you're scrolling Instagram, you see one of your friends is getting married, somebody's having kids, somebody's on holiday. Yeah, the holiday pics, you know, those those ones, they, they get you. <laughs> so, and, 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 okay. So the thing is, firstly, none of that is, is reality because everyone's posting only their best parts of their life on there. So all, you, all you're seeing with every scroll is the best parts of someone's life. And that can definitely make you feel like your life is, is not great because you think that's their whole life. You, you don't know what, even like you don't know what's happening. They could have been arguing with their partner on that table from where they're posting the food. You mm-hmm. don't know what's happening behind the scenes, right? Okay. Um, but coming back to meditation, right? So if we train, for example, in something simple like appreciation, gratitude of, of how good is my life right now? You know, like things that I'm thankful for. Simple, five to 10 minutes in the morning. You just sit there and you just reflect on that in your mind, all the things that you're grateful for. All of a sudden, in your, in your mind stream, the thoughts that are there are thoughts of, I have so much. I'm, I'm so blessed. L- like, I'm, I'm so blessed that actually I feel, I feel like I need, to, I need to give. I need to you know, give other people so they can also be happy. You know, this same mind, we can cultivate this and it doesn't take long. It, it really doesn't take long. We can, we can cultivate this, right? And, and when you cultivate that, then you go on Instagram and you see those things. Actually, we have the power, all of us, to look at someone doing well and say, I, I'm so happy for this person. Yeah, you know, true. may they have even more. Because like, I, I have it. I'm so blessed. Like, what, why should I be um, unhappy if someone else is, is doing well? I should be happy for them, you know? And, um, so this is how meditation can help. Like real practical stuff that people feel on a, on a daily basis um, is what can, can change with, with meditation. Um, the same goes for your relationships. You know, we have so we carry around so much resentment or anger, um, feeling like we're not respected, all of these things. All of that can be changed with um, new views, uh, new yeah, new views, essentially, a new lens for looking at things. And that's there's, there's practices for doing that. And that's so interesting what you're saying. And I also think I want to add new habits. And as you, you, know, you were saying, this practice, because I know that, for example, when I've implement, implemented in my own life kind of forgiveness meditations or meditating on forgiveness and sending out this love and forgiveness and um, the hoponopono, this Hawaiian phrase of, um, uh, what is it? I, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I love you. Thank you. I sometimes implement that. And it, and it just, it does. It's like training the mind as you'd play a musical instrument or, or training yes. yourself and you become better over the years. Um, and then it makes it easier to not, because ultimately when we're holding these emotions in our body against someone else and we think we're directing them towards the other person, we're holding them inside and they're just damaging ourselves ultimately. You know, this anger, this rage, this this resentment that we hold against other people. So um, I just wanted to compliment that. But it was very, um, uh, really interesting what you were saying earlier on as well about the, the mind and um, the breath. You spoke a little bit about that. And I know it's something we've mentioned before. And uh, I know that in Ayurveda, we know that around 80 to 90 percent of uh, they say all disease or these illnesses, diseases that we suffer from uh, can be actually linked to Vata Dosha, which is very much the seat is is the mind, this this wind, this air, this space, this excess uh, stress, anxiety that causes all sorts of disruptions within the body. For example, this uh, constant fight or flight mode that we might be in can um, really affect our microbiome, our digestion, our hormones, um, even our, our sleep. And when everything gets out of sync, this is when you know our it ultimately affects our lifestyle, maybe our, our habits and and what we choose to eat, or how much time we have to cook fresh food for ourselves. So, and and the, the actually the microbiome can change based on these these uh, pH level in your body, which can really change due to stress. So, and it might make you crave more things like refined sugar or or different types of foods that are heavy in the body and um, and actually are going to add to clouding your mind even more and making you more stressed and anxious. So I know I've gone off uh, a bit, but I wanted to ask you a bit if you could talk about the connection between uh, the mind and breath, and then maybe later we can also go on to to lifestyle and talking about 
the lifestyle around meditation in terms of food, diet, but everything, the, the qualities of lifestyle. Yes. Yes. Okay. So mind and breath, actually, it's really, really simple. I feel like a lot of people already already know this, but we can, we can bring it to life um, for them. So we know that when we are negative emotions, like let's say you're angry, right? When you're angry, your breath is uh, short, it's rough, like shallow, right? You're mm-hmm. huffing and puffing. Um, when, you, when you're scared, like immediately when you're scared, like you gasp and like it's a shallow, shallow breath, right? Negative emotions, they have this. They have this um, quality where the breath is shallow, it's rough, it's choppy, it's short. Um, it's not good kind of breathing, okay? So the connection between like meditation and breath. So the ancient yogis, okay, who devised the entire science of, of pranayama, they were quite obsessed with this concept of, of mind and breath, okay? And they realized that, okay, when we have negative emotions, our breath is short, choppy, uh, rough. And when we are relaxed and when we're in a good mood, then naturally when we're concentrated, yeah, our breath becomes quite um, smooth and, and long. Even if it's not long, it's quite, it's quite smooth. It's really oxygenating the system. So if emotions can affect our breathing, they wanted to see, can our breathing <laughs> affect our emotions, right? So if we can change, uh, if, if our breath changes when our emotions change, then can our emotions also change by us changing our breathing? So they tested it out and quite simply, yes, <laughs> you know, it, it, it can, right? This is why um, whenever we're stressed or someone's panicking, we say, breathe, breathe, like breathe deeply, breathe deeply, right? This is exactly that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, breath, breath and mind are, are completely connected. Now, connecting this to what you were saying about health and the uh, fight or flight state that we're constantly in, um, this, is, this is all connected uh, as well, right? So in, in really simple terms, when your breath is long and smooth and deep, you are relaxed. Your body is in the, in the relaxed state. And when you're in the other, um, you're, you're in fight or flight. So if we can just consciously, consciously ensure that we are in the rest, in, 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 a, in a relaxed state, by making sure that our breath is, is nice and long, it, it, makes, it makes all the difference, right? And that's directly connected, to, directly connected to the mind. So I was telling you this yesterday. In fact, let me give you that model, which is quite easy for people to, to understand. So ultimately, all of this, right? Okay, let's just take a breath. Okay, and come back to the main point. The main point that we're trying to achieve here with meditation is a mind that is peaceful, positive, happy, right? Uh, so let's just look at like the two kinds of mind and what we want. So the kind of mind we don't want is the scattered mind, okay? Scattered mind, monkey mind, too many thoughts all over the place, negative thoughts. Um, on the flip side of the scattered mind is the one-pointed mind. One-pointed is a term used in yoga. It basically means concentrated, mindful, in one place, aware of one thing, okay? It's kind of like uh, when you are totally engrossed in something, um, you know, the flow state that we speak about, a cook, that a chef that is engrossed in his uh, cooking or an artist that's painting or a yogi that is meditating and, and you know, focusing on, on one, one thing. Um, these are all states. These are the, the states where the mind is, is one-pointed. In this state, the mind is it, it's, it's happy. That's what you want, right? In this state, naturally, your breath also will be long and smooth and, and deep. Uh, and you will be in the relaxation um, response. You're not going to be in the, in the fight, or, fight or flight, right? So you're at ease, essentially. So what, what we want to do ultimately is we want to stay in that state as much as we possibly can. And for this, people start doing meditation, but then they forget. So they'll do the meditation in the morning and then they'll just carry on the rest of the day, hoping that it somehow carries through. <laughs> it's not gonna carry through, right? We have to, we have to do something. Um, and it's as simple as, so I have a, a timer on my phone. So every hour there's a bell that rings. And when the bell rings, I kind of just take a break from whatever I'm doing. I, I get up, I, I breathe a little, I just you know think think something positive like recite mantra and just come back 
come back home, like to center and, and just, just relax again. And just doing that, it takes two minutes. Just doing that, it keeps you in that state again for the next kind of, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes until that bell rings again. And then you can bring yourself back in, in that state. And, and this way, you, you can spend a lot of your day, you know, almost like at least more than 50% of your day relaxed and, and, and chilled. And this means that you're, you're at ease, you know, your body is at ease. And this is where it's at ease versus this ease, right? Mm -hmm. So if we, if just by being in that state, it, it uh, fosters good health and healing. It's, it's, yeah, that's, uh, that's so amazing what you're saying. Yes. And it makes me think of, it reminds me of, um, yoga practice. And I know you mentioned that and like the yoga sutras, um, and uh, dharana is it the focus, the concentration? Dharana, uh, yes. Yes. So part of yoga, I mean, um, having done hatha yoga for many years is obviously focus, extreme focus on a point or in a, in an asana, but then also coming out of that and coming into this rest state. So it's almost holding this focus in the body and on a point, especially with postures that um, work on balance. And then coming out and resting. And uh, there's very much a balance between this focus and this rest and what you said about taking a rest and how important it is for the mind to rest. Um, and it just reminded me of yoga practice and how, and this is what I wanted to do through Gaya Ayurveda, because I find that um, it's so holistic. It's not just Ayurveda diet nutrition. It's, it's, it's mind, it's meditation, it's yoga. It's all these things that are that uh, work on a body, mind, soul level that allow us to bring balance and use these tools and learn tools to, to allow us to bring balance into our life. And as you said, not just uh, prevent, uh, not just uh, heal from disease or disease, but also prevent it long term. Um, and yes. I wanted then to, yes, and I wanted then to ask you, so since we're on this topic in terms of a bit of lifestyle, um, I know you've spoken about that in some of your content that you put out on YouTube and Instagram, but in terms of lifestyle and the the three qualities or the gunas of Satvarajas Tamas, could you just comment on that? How um, What would be a, a lifestyle that would be um, accompanying and helping um, your meditation practice for some of our listeners if they wanted to adopt some of these practices to help their technique? Yeah, okay. Uh, so we'll speak a little bit about Sattva, Rajas, and, and Tamas um, first, and then go into the, the lifestyle. So in, in, in simple terms, right, what Ayurveda and these sciences are saying is that everything in this universe is governed by qualities, certain qualities, and the three main qualities are Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas. So Sattva is the quality of, you can say it's, it's purity. Um, Rajas is the active principle so it's it's action and tamas is inertia which is it is inert right so not not moving um so from a, from a meditation perspective you know we we tend to speak about these quite quite literally so let's just speak about food for example when it when it comes to when it comes to lifestyle right so what we're saying um in very a common sense way is that what we put into our body becomes the body right your food what, what happens your, your food that you eat <laughs> that's how you've grown from a baby to your size right now it's Definitely. the stuff that you've eaten yeah your body has taken the good parts and like uh, flushed away the, the bad parts but mm -hmm. that's how you've been growing so when we say you are what you eat like quite literally you are <laughs> the food yeah. the food that you eat yeah so here then it comes to okay so what is the quality of the food that i'm eating Right? Is it is it that pure food, or is it food that's going to make me really action oriented, or is it food that's going to make me lazy? You know, what is it that I'm putting into my into my body? So the sattvic kind of food, and and remember when we speak about body and mind, it's not the mind is not here. We're not talking the brain is not the mind, right? Brain is something separate. The mind is just the subtle part of your body. Yeah. So if you try to identify where your mind is i mean like wh where do you feel emotions like where do you feel fear you, you feel it here in your chest but where do you mm -hmm. feel anger you feel it rising here right so the, the mind is just it's a subtle part of the body body and mind are not separate body and mind are one yeah so this is why 
the food that you eat, it's not just affecting your body, it's also affecting your mind because the mind is a really subtle part of the body. So satvic food, you can say, is what we call pure food or clean food. So this is food that is like fresh, right? Fresh, natural food, fresh fruits, vegetables, all these things, um, or food in, in the, the pure state it can be. So food that is cooked quite fresh, um, not, not cooked and ruined, uh, or like burned, right? Like not like that masala kind of cooking, <laughs> but mm-hmm. just cooked, uh, cook, cook light, right? Uh, boiled vegetables or like steamed vegetables, lightly stir fried vegetables. This this kind of food, um, and on the same day. So it's not it's not been there lying there for like two days in the fridge. It's it's fresh. You're cooking and eating on the same day. This you can say is a sattvic food. It's natural. It's the closest to its natural state as possible. Yeah, purity. That's how mm-hmm. purity. Um, okay, so so the more we can eat of that in the modern world, you know, we call the, the whole food plant based diet, right? Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean like that processed stuff that doesn't come into the, the sattvic food, like the the fake uh, meat, the meat substitutes, and all of that. That's probably yeah, not fake meat food, or right? fake. Yeah, and I guess anything okay. pro- processed, processed meaning that's even packaged and can stay on the shelf, you know, for multiple for a multiple amount of time, because I think maybe there's also some confusion between what is process. Process is anything that's highly um, like pasteurized, um, even fermented, like uh, boiled to a state where you're actually killing the, the life energy inside. You know? And it stays for a very long time. And therefore, it's just not yes. digestible or recognizable by the body. Yes, yes. So... So here we're speaking purely from a meditation perspective. Obviously, Ayurveda recommends the five taste diet, right? So you're going to have like a bit of pickle in there, which is which is good to eat as well. Mm. But uh, purely from from meditation standpoint, the sattvic means this, like pure natural food. Um, then you have the the rajasic food. So rajasic means uh, it's the the action. Okay, so action means a food that is stimulating in nature. So what's stimulating? Obviously, chili is stimulating. Onions, garlic, these things are stimulating. Um, processed food, all the chocolates and crisps and stuff that we love, <laughs> all of that, all of that is is rajasic food. Okay, um, so food that's stimulating in nature. Coffee, of course, coffee and tea, cigarettes, all these things. Um, so these are they're stimulating in nature, which means that if someone was living a meditation lifestyle where they're really serious and want to go really deep and access deep states, then it's recommended that you reduce as much as possible the intake of these kind of foods because they just stimulate your system. And stimulation is the opposite to, uh, you know, rest, relaxation, and, and turning inward, right? So this is a, a natural thing that, that happens. Um, it's also the other way, by the way. So when you practice a lot of meditation, naturally, your body will ask less for these kind of things, you know? Like with me and quitting my bad habits, like I, I spoke about like meditation helping me quit that stuff. It was simply, yeah, like I'm not giving myself any credit. It's just that by practicing meditation, I desired them less and, and they mm. could naturally fade away. You know, I'm not saying that I went against the grain and, and really tried hard. Like I, it, it's like, oh, not completely, but almost effortless, you can say. Like you meditate and you like you have your desires go down for these things. Okay. So sattva, pure food, rajas is the stimulating food. Yeah. And then tamas is uh, inertia. So inertia is like dead. Yeah, d- dead food that is, uh, it's, it's going to, like, you know, it's going to make you lazy, right? So when, when you have that, that mac and cheese in front of you and you've got <laughs> the, the fries and like the cheese and the all of oil. that. Okay, that yeah. yeah, yeah, that. So, so you, we don't need to like be too scientific. You can just look at food and, yeah. and be and understand what it is, right? So when you know that after this, you know, we say, oh, I'm going to eat that and knock out. Yeah, um, I'm going to pass out. That's, food coma. That's the, yes, yes. So that, that's that's the tamasic food. Um, so having that naturally, it's it's very low in life energy. Um, so in terms of lifestyle, obviously, I'm never going to say you know cut it out completely. Uh, but you know we we want to try to have less of that. But none of this again is. I'm not saying anything new here. I mean, we all know this. We, you know, we we know it for centuries. <laughs> We, we know it already. Uh, but yeah, that's that's Sattva Rajasthamas. So in terms of a meditative lifestyle, you want your lifestyle in multiple ways to be as, as Sattvic as possible. 
as pure as possible. So, you know, your, your food is light, your food is clean. That's why in India, when you go to spiritual organizations and like, for example, if you go to like the ashrams and you see the kind of food that they serve in ashrams, it's, it's very, it's tasty. It's very tasty, but it's simple. Uh, it, it's simple. It, it's such a food, right? At the same time, food is not just what we take in through the mouth um, because we have other senses as well. So even your, the stuff that you consume, the media that you consume, audio, video, all of that is, is food as well. So, and, and that all comes and, and, you know, impresses on the mind, right? So if, if you're trying to cultivate peace in your life, so you do 20 minutes of meditation in the morning, and then you go and watch two hours of horror on Netflix, <laughs> that's not very, <laughs> it's not very conducive, right? You're undoing the hard work that you've done. So negative news, gossiping, um, horror movies, action movies with violence, uh, negative news once more, all of that is, is probably stuff you want to you wanna stay away from. Mm -hmm. um, I've said a lot. So no, that's can... fascinating, and thank you for going so in depth. Because as you say, it's um, very—it's not even complimentary. I mean, Ayurveda, the Vedas, these ancient knowledge developed all together in a way with yogic theory, with um, with Buddhism. So it's so interesting that you explain that because it's very um, pertinent in Ayurveda as well. We have these satvic Vedas and Tamasic qualities, um, but it and it is very interesting what you were just saying about the five senses. And I know we earlier on, we talked briefly about how med meditation can help us manage some of these unwanted emotions. But maybe um, could you talk a, bit, a little bit more about the five senses and and the mind and and how they can? Because in Ayurveda, we do also say that everything is information. As you said, food is information. So is the news. So is everything you watch, everything you take in through your five senses and digest and metabolize can have a certain effect on your body. But um, yes. briefly, we spoke, we've kind of gone across how meditation can be beneficial and help um, with some negative emotions. But if we can go into that more deeply, like how can we, how do you think meditation can help to manage so-called negative emotions such as fear, frustration, anger, depression? But also we spoke about the five senses and how, um, for me, this has helped me in my life because uh, I didn't have consciousness or I wasn't so aware of okay we have these five senses which is a key philosophy and part of the theory of ayurveda and meditation and yoga theory that for example negative emotions might arise because i hear something that i don't like or i see something yeah. that makes me angry so if you could just yeah. um go deeper into that i'd be very grateful okay so we'll take we'll take that as two questions right so one is the the five senses Hearing something, for example, hearing something and feeling angry. How can you like manage that and, and improve that and, and not feel angry? Right. That's that's the question. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. And the, the second one is just managing negative emotions in general, like fear, um, anger, those those type of things, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So with with the with the first one, it's it's really <laughs> it's a really interesting question, right? So that example that you gave, I love that example about hearing something and and feeling angry right this happens it's like you're in traffic someone's honking at you from behind and you know if you're like some why do some people get so angry and other people are just like mm, no big deal this is just this is <laughs> yeah. just it yeah so th there's a few there's a few different ways to to look at it right but if we understand it really simply it comes down to how reactive we are and how much non-reaction like have we cultivated within us right so this is what um we what we do in this is so when you're doing meditations like breath meditation or awareness meditation this is what you are training yourself to do essentially is simply to be aware of what is happening and not react to it but actually come back to what you're being aware of anyway okay so i'll give you a real, i'll give you a real life example yeah one one of anger Okay, so if we look at anger, like what, what's actually happening here? Let's just look at that a bit deeper. So you hear someone does something you don't like, or you hear a sound, like someone honking, okay? So that's the external thing that's happened. It's come into your ear, okay? And that has sent a message to your brain, and somehow there is a sensation, okay? You feel a sensation of anger, which is usually this, this like hot, burning sensation in your chest. Okay, 
Now, for somebody who is uh, like like not trained, you can say, when that hot sensation comes, the reflex is to burst out in anger. Okay, so hear something, sends a message, sensation created. That sensation, because it's it's you don't like it, your, your body is not enjoying that sensation, and that means that it's going to respond in some way, and it creates this this angry reaction from you. What the hell? Why is he? Why is he honking? You know, this this kind of thing. Okay. In meditation, what we're doing is we are being an observer. We are watching what is happening. Um, and things will be happening even when you're sitting there completely still. Remember that your mind is a storehouse of all your experiences from lifetimes. Yeah. But at least since in this lifetime, since you're born, everything has been stored in there. So even when you're just sitting there trying to be, you know, like relax, thoughts will come. And thoughts of any kind can come. It could be somebody that you fought with a long time ago. It could be what you want to have for dinner. It could be, oh, this person said this to me. You know, I, I need to, I, this is what I'm going to say next time. I'm going to, I'm going to set the record straight, right? Yeah. Well, all these, all these thoughts are coming. So what you, and, and with those thoughts are sensations. Sensations are, are coming up in your, in your consciousness as well. So you're training yourself essentially to allow it to come. It's going to come. And once you realize that, oh, this is coming. Yeah, I'm getting this thought or I'm getting a sensation. You say, okay, no worries. Let it be there. And I'm going to bring my attention back to my breathing. Okay. So you are practicing choosing where to place your attention. Okay. So you say, I'm, that's fine. Let that sensation be there. Uh, I can, I can let it be there and I can come back to my breathing. Yeah. Or I can come back to listening to a sound or whatever it is that you're meditating on at that point. So, now that you start doing this, the first thing that you learn is, so I actually have a choice. I can choose to let the sensation be and, and come back to what I'm doing. And it will, it will evaporate anyway. It's, it's going to evaporate, right? It's, it's, it's temporary. It's just a temporary thing that comes and, and it goes. And when you realize that, you're like, wow, okay, so I don't need to hold on to this thing. If a sensation comes, it's, its nature is that it comes and it goes. It's temporary. It's not going to... It's temporary. It's not going to be there. Um, yeah. And, and you can, you can let it go. So when you train in this way, then slowly, slowly you get better at, uh, just letting things come and, and go and, and just focusing on what you were doing anyway. So mm -hmm. let's say you're, you're driving and someone's honking behind you and you feel the sensation. That's where that mindfulness will come in immediately. And you can say, okay, this is, you know, it, it's just a sensation. It's just a sound doesn't really matter i'm gonna i'm gonna let it be there i'm gonna continue doing what i'm doing um that's a really simple way in which it it helps like in terms of the in terms of the senses does that does that answer your, your question definitely yes and that's so fascinating what you're saying and and i think being able to observe that we have outside things that trigger these sensations in the body is is such a practice in itself you know, and I think that's the beauty of meditation or any kind of internal reflection is just putting awareness on the body, putting awareness of where does this emotion rise within me. Yeah, and uh, I'd like to tell you the real benefit I feel for people, you know, which which I've experienced myself, is in in relationships. In relationships, you know, when when you're you're having a heated conversation and you can feel now that you start beginning to notice that that anger coming. You realize, okay, hold on, this anger is coming. I, I could actually burst out and say something that I don't want to. So why don't I take a time out? Why don't I take a time out and, and just just go away for a bit? You know, there's this there is this uh, this this story, this uh, like short short funny story. So a guy goes to a Buddhist monk and he tells the Buddhist monk that look, I, I love I love my wife so much, right? I love my wife and I, I'm I'm a really good person, but I get angry. Like I, I get angry and I really upset her. So how can I change this? Yeah. How, and you know, how can I change this? Because I just can't seem to not be angry. Um, I just can't seem to not be angry. And the Buddhist monk tells them, don't worry. You don't need to not be angry. I can help you change it without you having to stop being angry. And he's like, what? What, 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 what does that mean? And he's <laughs> like, great, tell me. <laughs> tell me what to do. Uh, so the monk tells them that you can be angry. Okay. You're allowed to be angry. But when 
the, from the moment that you feel angry, yeah, what you need to do is you need to wait 24 hours before you express the anger. Okay. And then the next day you can go and be as angry as you want. And he's like, and, and she wouldn't mind. He's like, no, she wouldn't <laughs> mind. Don't worry. You, you can do that. So, 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 so naturally he goes away and, you know, he notices the anger and he says, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to wait 24 hours and I'm going to go and, you know, just, just say what I want. And naturally he goes away and that anger fades away. By the next day, he's even forgotten what he was angry about. Right. <laughs> so th these things, I think the point I'm trying to make is they're, they're temporary. We think there's such a big deal and they're there, but they are actually temporary. If you, if you just let it be, uh, it will, it will pass and it will, it will go. Um, so practically speaking, you know, for people like, yes, it's, it's all good, like being calm and peaceful, but one of the real benefits is, is your relationships will, will really improve, um, you know, slowly, slowly, nothing, nothing in one day, but uh, they, they will improve and, and they'll be on an upward trajectory because now you're in control. Now you can, you're constantly working yourself. And that means that you're constantly improving the relationship, the relationships that you're in. And that's, that's, that's priceless. It, it's, it's so priceless. That's beautiful. Yeah, and thank you for sharing the story with us. That's very relatable and a great thing that we can remember. Um, and I wanted to just compliment that because in, in Ayurveda as well, all these emotions can actually imbalance your doshas. So I always remember my teacher telling me that uh, when we get angry, we can the pH like of our environment, of our body, this heat can cause our imbalances even in our gut bacteria. So um, in the microbiome, so like people who are angry all the time, and also, as you said, about these the qualities of the food, when we're taking on like Raja's food, for example, this, this food that gives us a lot of action or activity, this can increase the heat of your body and exacerbate these emotions. And it can be like a vicious cycle that we cannot get out of sometimes. Um, so it's also detrimental, as we said, not only are you like externalizing it to the other person, but you're you're keeping it within your body and these these uh, these feelings can also harm you in the long term if you keep going back into them. So I know we've spoken for quite a while, so I'll just uh, ask you the last few questions. Um, but it was really interesting what you were just saying about how um, recognizing you know, these emotions, these unwanted emotions when they come up in our body, and especially when an external trigger triggers them within our system. And I know that we briefly discussed um, an analogy you know, of, of seeing the other as uh, maybe not as an enemy or but as something more or friend um so if you could just explain about that maybe a technique as well that we can use to not um to help us manage these feelings of like separation that the other you know this person has done me wrong this person is against me and uh you know i can never speak to this person again yes okay so here we're speaking like mainly about relationships and uh, where we have a bit of anger or we're not getting along with someone, how to feel better about that in, in our life and, and day. That's that's what the question, yeah? Yes, how to manage these emotions, because I think we, especially in the Western world, we've gone into such extreme individualization um, yes. you know, that we can do everything on our own. We, um, depending on which culture, but we've sometimes and also going into this trauma and this healing of okay maybe it's healthy to have distance from people and how healthy to have difference from distance from family but also coming back to these basic concepts of buddhism that um this yes. the fact that we're not essentially all separated um so just yes. uh, if you can better show some light or, or shine some light on on this separation we feel between one another yeah for sure so this is this is a huge one that you've you brought up and I feel like it's the foundation of uh, of like if, if you listen to Dalai Lama and like Dalai Lama's teachings right this is this is the foundation the foundation of uh, of happiness which is that we live in this wrong idea that we are separate yeah it's we're not we're not some separate entity in fact we are all we're all connected um okay so I don't want to go into the, the spiritual aspect of like how we're all connected. Like, yes, you know, we, we can say that we're all spirit or like we all have Buddha nature or we the divine resides in all of us, right? These are different views that, that are taken in different traditions. But let's be let's be practical, right? In terms of how we're all connected, right? So we, like you said, in the West, like we have this idea 
that uh, we can be independent. And, you know, I, I don't need anybody else. I'm, I'm independent and I can fend for myself and I can feed myself and I can be happy by my, you know, by myself. <laughs> I don't need anyone. So like even, even just for that, right? It's looking at a really simple thing. So I'll, I'll ask you, let's do a, a practical exercise. So what did you eat for breakfast this morning? Uh, I had some gluten-free pancakes <laughs> with uh, okay. some avocado on top. Yeah. Okay. Like guacamole so for the for the pancake, right? Just tell me like the ingredients of the pancakes. Like what what were they? Uh, I had buckwheat flour, rice flour, uh, some water, and eggs. So so if we just look at each of those, right? The the flour that you got, the eggs that you got, the avocado you got, you got it from a a supermarket or a market, I imagine. Okay. Mm -hmm. So firstly, there's there's a bunch of people there that have set up shop and are selling that. So for you to, to actually have breakfast and be on this podcast right now, you need those people. Yeah, without those people, it's impossible for you to do it. Mm -hmm. But even, even they got that from somewhere, right? So they, where did the flower come from? Like if I asked you, where, where did the flower come from? Oh, like where the did the buckwheat come from? I think it comes from Europe, I think. But the rice flower definitely probably comes from India or Asia. Yeah. Okay. So, so, just, so just in that, in that, and then there's the avocado as well, which is probably and the avocado. From, from... Well, I tried to yeah. because of Ayurveda, I tried to buy local and in season. So I okay. try to buy avocados from Spain, and otherwise I try not yeah. to consume the avocados. Although every once in a while I have consumed an avocado from like uh, yeah Peru or Kenya. Okay. Hmm. Wow. Okay. So so, so just. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that's a bit long-winded, but I'm just just trying to make make a point, right? So just on that plate that you ate this morning, we have people involved from your local market to other countries to Kenya and Peru. So these are actual living beings, yeah. Who who we think? Oh, I don't like I I'm fine on my own. I'm totally independent, mm. right? But just for that that little meal, there's probably like ten people that are responsible for putting that on on the plate. Um, not to mention the stuff that you cooked it in, not to mention the place you're living in, not to mention, like, so the point is that we are not, uh, we, we can't be independent. We're literally dependent on everyone for, yeah. for anything that we do. Okay. So the, the idea is, is this, okay. The idea is this, that because we're dependent on everyone, we, like, we keep saying me, 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 that, you know, like just, Self-cherishing, self-cherishing, right? So Dalai Lama says, so there is this quote from the Bodhisattva's way of life by Shantideva. And the quote is, is really simple. It says that all suffering comes from wishing good for oneself. Okay. All suffering comes from the self-cherishing thought. Me, 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 me. Yeah. That's what brings suffering. And all happiness, all happiness is born from the thought of benefiting others. Okay, all happiness is born from the thought of benefiting others. So this is, I'm not going to expect that people will listen to this and be like, that's, I, I, that, like, that's so cool, or I, I agree to that. Because when I heard it for, for the first time, I, I didn't agree. I felt I like agree. that's it's so beautiful. I totally agree. But yes. Okay. Mm. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's good that you do, but it's also, it's something we don't really want to, like, we don't want to hear that. You know, we don't want to hear that. Mm. Oh, why should I not think about myself and and so on and so forth? But it's just it's just simple things, right? Like if we we do something nice for someone, um, it how do we feel? Well, if we we feel we feel amazing and we feel really good, and there's a kind of satisfaction that it's it's a bit it's a bit more like long lasting. There's a sense of peace that's there when when we act in that way, um, as opposed to just gratifying ourselves. When we gratify ourselves, like look at anything, whether it's um, buying a new car or whatever it is like it, it dies off like pretty pretty soon right a few days maybe a month but like that that effect dies off but this feeling where like you're living in contribution to, to something else there is all of a sudden a sense of purpose that comes and from that sense of purpose there is a self a sense of importance that comes for you like you feel like actually i'm worth something because i'm contributing to other people so all the stuff that we speak about, like depression, yeah, it comes from from having low low self esteem, thinking that you know you're not good enough or people don't want you. But could it be because you you 
we've been thinking in the wrong way. We've been thinking about me, 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 me. What Dalai Lama says is that the moment that you change, the moment you change your view from yourself to how can I be of benefit to others, then everything changes, you know? Everything changes. It's like the, the flowers bloom and, you know, the sun is shining. That's that's literally how it happens. Um, so I'm, I'm not sitting here on, on a pedestal and, and saying that, this is like I've not come up with this, right? This is like the Buddha's teachings and, and what the Dalai Lama says. And I'm I'm trying my best to to embody this as much as I can. Um, but yeah, it, it works. And and I think and I think everyone should do that, right? So that's a bit about how to deal with negative emotions. It's not changing our perspective. Okay. Um and then the other thing you asked was about uh like viewing beings as, as our mother. Um so this is this is this is part of that, right? So if we simplify it, it's basically changing our view and changing how we look at things, um, changing the lens with which we look at things, right? So um, in in the Indian tradition, right, where like Hinduism, where there's, you know, concept of the divine. So we have like personal forms of the divine, right? Like the goddess or Shiva or Krishna or things like that. So there the belief is that this, you know, my my goddess, right? Lakshmi. Lakshmi is actually all pervading. She is present in all things and in all beings. Okay. So when I interact with people, if I can train myself that hold on, hold on, this person appears like a human, but inside divine is present. Yeah, inside divine is present. And for a change, let me speak to the let me speak to the divine in them, as opposed to speaking to this outer thing. Yeah. Um, that's like through that, that's one way that we can train ourselves to kind of uh, feel better about about other people like it's easier to be kind when you know that the god you believe in actually isn't that person <laughs> mm -hmm. it, you know it, it's, much, it's much easier so another view that can be used to kind of feel better about our interactions with people and us to be more loving essentially comes from the buddhist tradition okay so this one's it, it's, it's really cool and it, it's a full meditation it's a full meditation practice that's done to cultivate this view so it's simply this that us sentient beings have been around for so long right we've taken so many so many so many births and rebirths that there is enough time has passed in in the history of you know sentient beings enough time has passed that every other being out there in one life or another has been your mother Okay, so the idea is this, that you are looking at your mother in this lifetime, if you have a good relationship with her or anyone, you know, you have a good relationship with that has done so much for you, that has cared for you, that has fed you, that has clothed you and sent you to school and all these things and probably gone through so many sacrifices in their own life to make this happen for you and, and much more, much more. The kind of care that... Um, you know, you don't you don't normally you don't normally get from from anybody else. In this lifetime, that may be your mother, okay. But everyone that you interact with, especially the people that you interact with in your life, you know, they're there in your life because there is some previous karmic connection. That's why they are, are there again. You know, there's already some connection, and no matter what their role is in your life right now, in a previous lifetime, they have been someone who's really close to you and has really cared for you. Like, like a mother, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's the first step, which is just acknowledging this, that this is this is true. And, and, and it makes sense because we've been around for so long. We've kept on, on coming back. So it's actually, it's impossible that this is not true because, you know, it's not like we carry on the same relationships every time. Um, we come in in different, different forms, right? So if that's true, then that means that I owe, I owe these people a lot. I, I need to repay that kindness in some way. You know, I, mm -hmm. I literally owe it. I owe it to them, just like I owe it to my mom in this life to repay the kindness that she's given me. So you just reflect, reflect on this and try to, you know, get used to the idea that, okay, this person, like all the relationships I have right now, good, bad, whatever labels, you know, they have right now, they may not have been the same before, right? So an enemy right now, Maybe just an enemy right now, in a really short span of time, like this lifetime, right? They not before they could have been someone really close to me. 
or even in this life, you know, how many times have you had like someone who's really close to you and all of a sudden in one day, they're your enemy, you know, uh, even, even there it's true. Mm. Even in this lifetime, the same, the same thing is true. Right. So viewing them in that way that, okay, I owe them, I need to repay their kindness. Right. So in this lifetime, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to be really good to them, try to be really loving to them. And even if they're in a situation where it's hard for me to love them, right, maybe they're always asking for my help, or maybe they're so sick that I can't be there for them, or maybe they make me angry, they're, like they, they cheated on me or something, right? Uh, they, they've hurt me so much, but I want to actually try my best to be kind to them and, and to, be, to be loving to them, right? So this is, you know, this doesn't happen in one session, right? In the, in the Buddhist tradition, in the Tibetan tradition, they actually, this is ingrained into their society. Um, I believe they have a word for it as well. They, 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 they speak about all beings as mother, beloved mother sentient beings. Okay, this is how they speak about like everyone else. Just, mm. so can you imagine how much love there is in, in, that, in that society? And this is how they're speaking about people or referring to people. Um, so, so training in this way, basically, you, you view everyone as that. And it just comes down to this, that when someone's giving you a hard time, um, you, you like separate what they're doing right now from the fact that, okay, fine, they're being really bad right now, acknowledged, but they've done so much for me, like before. So this doesn't like, you know, negate that. I need to, for that reason, I need to be good to them. And this will, this will motivate you in, in some way to, to actually practice kindness. And obviously when, when you do that and you see the change, you know, like literally one hug to someone or forget one, one hug, one, one listening ear where you pull up someone who you're not speaking to and you say to them, look, forget about all our arguments. Okay. Today, I want to listen to you. Today, I want you to tell me what you feel. and I'm not going to say anything like just, just that, that thing. Um, yeah. I'm sure there's, there's people coming to mind for a lot of people mm, <laughs> right now. Beautiful. Though. Yeah. It's a really good, handy recommendation. Mm. And um, I wanted to compliment because I'm um, I'm also doing Gestalt training. So in in Gestalt therapy as well, uh, active listening is very a very important part of it. It's just actively listening to the other person, um, just to be an ear, not even to provide a solution, not to provide any answers, but just to witness and listen is really healing and really helps one another. And it reminded me when you were saying about societies and culture, and how this is kind of ingrained in the society. I know some of my Indian friends. Uh, and being in India, like uh, when especially women, I'm not sure about men, but they call it like even someone who's not their auntie, auntie, you know, or a sister, like auntie, you know, uh, yes, it, yes. I feel this um, concept of like, you know, this is my auntie, this other woman is my auntie or she's part of my family. Um, yeah. And I very much see my friends even as my sisters of on this planet. But it, you know, it did take a quite a, a while to think that way. But when you think about people as your brothers and sisters, it totally changes the dynamic um that we yeah, all have this this was fun. this this is like a really relevant one it was funny for me actually because when when i went to so, so in, in my family that's how we speak right so anyone who's just a friend of your parents like they're your auntie or they're your uncle that's that's how it is so when mm -hmm. i went to the uk and i started you know interacting with english people for the first time then it was like can can i call you my auntie <laughs> can i not <laughs> Uh, so yeah that's that's a, a really good observation for sure great um well so we're just coming to the end of our time together even though i think we could talk about many more things um so i'll just yeah. ask you the last few questions so if you um could recommend two to three books for further reading maybe for people who are just getting into meditation but things that have really inspired you in terms of spirituality meditation and yoga yeah okay um, so the first one I would like to recommend, so I wouldn't recommend a book, but I'll recommend a person and they can go to this person, just type their name and, uh, and, and see what titles resonate with them, um, is the Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. Okay. So um, maybe, maybe, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh, should I yeah. spell it? So it's, uh, okay. So I'll spell it. I can it. So put it in the notes at the end as well. Yeah. Okay, mm. great. So, so Thich Nhat Hanh is a Vietnamese Zen master. He recently passed away in the COVID year, uh, but he is, how can I describe him? He is uh, healing and soothing and calmness in, in one cute human being, okay? He is literally like, 
like the definition of of peace and and mindfulness um oh mindfulness by the way in in the west that has become so popular he, i believe he's the one who coined that term and that's where okay. it comes from yeah so tiknat han um he has so many so many books and even like really short books like he's done a series on things like how to sit how to rest how to relax how to heal how to fight uh, yeah there's so so amazon just take that hand whatever you know catches your your fancy definitely read that that's great that's that's a great place to start and um i'll just recommend one more um uh, for people that are interested in uh, like let's say indian tradition like mantras mantra meditation uh things things like that like deities and and all that is uh, books by either swami shivananda okay or swami vishnu devananda okay i'll put that i'll give you the spellings for that um so there's one book called meditation and mantras by swami vishnu devananda uh which is incredible it it tell it speaks about mantras and what they are in terms of the sonic sounds of the universe how they carry you know their energy and then how to do the practice of of japa meditation and the benefits of it and you will realize like just how vast this science of uh, of, of just the science of mantras is and how beneficial it can be to to completely change your direction of life and and consciousness and the way you think and the way you view the world all of it right so that's that's a that's a great that's a great book that's one of my core practices which is why i'm 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 speaking about it um so those two take that hand and uh, and then and then mantra chanting i think that's what i recommend okay great thank you i will also get on that checking out some of those okay <laughs> Okay. And um, if you if you could just give a few tips or can you give any techniques that people who want to start meditating at home might implement? Yes. So I've actually created something to make it really simple. It's a it's a free 20 minute guided meditation um, on, on my website. So you just go to meditate with Rishi dot com and and download it and, and play it. Right. So it's it's free. So I, I created this for people who want to start meditation, but they don't quite know what to do. So it's, uh, I mean, I hope it's really relaxing. <laughs> I, I have got some some good feedback from the people that are doing it. Um, it's a really simple practice, right? So it's guiding you through um, relaxing the body, a bit of a body scan, and then and then focusing on your breath and just feeling calmer than than you were initially. Um, so that's one thing that you can do um, on my YouTube channel. There's tons of, of meditations um, as well. Um, and of course, you have all the apps, right? There's the Headspace and Calm and, and all of these things that, that you can you can start with. But um, for technique wise, that's that's what I'd say. Um, what what else were you asking? Okay, no, that's great. That would be really good. And I will also check out that twenty minute guide you have. Um, okay. And then, so if anyone else wants to get in touch with you or know about the services you offer, um, if you could just yeah. let us know, because I think you do some you do coaching. If you could just explain to us briefly about your services. Yes. Okay. So I do do coaching. It's uh, so the coaching I do is is one one to one coaching. This is something that I, I like enjoy a lot because we can go really deep um, on an individual level. So of course it's it's learning meditation, right? So learning different techniques. Like of course that's going to be there, but it's it's really for people who are they, they, they want to transform in, in some way, right? So whether they're trying to change habits or whether they want to um, just be more, like experience more like love and kindness and, and these type of things. And also people who are getting started with spirituality and there's a bit of confusion as to, okay, what's the right path for me? You know, there's so much information on the internet. Um, am I going in? So I've spent the last kind of, since 2019 to now, what is that, three or four years? So I've spent the last three or four years literally studying different spiritual parts, yoga, all the different types of Buddhism, uh, you know, parts within yoga, like bhakti and, and all of the stuff and trying to get my head around what is my part actually, because it, 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 it can seem clear initially because maybe your family believes in something, but actually that's not what you resonate with at a deep level. And then it's exploring what is that and finding what is genuine in that. Because like I'm not, I'm not a guru, right? I'm I'm teaching basic foundational meditation that can that can help you know help you like relax a bit and make you a bit happier. But uh, ultimately, people interested in spiritual growth they'll want to go for somebody who is 
a, a real teacher or like a, a real path that has been there for a, a long time, you know, that's traditional, that will take you where you need to go. So identifying what could be right for you. So this is this is something that I, you know, we work on in the coaching as well. Like really getting to know yourself and your your beliefs, like, you know, what what is the direction you should go in? Um, that kind of stuff. So in simple terms, you can say just like not everyone hires a instructor in the gym. Um, not everyone will hire a meditation coach, right? So this is for people that want to go a little bit deeper into their practice. It's not for everyone. Um, but yeah, the website is meditatewithrishi.com. Um, there's free resources on there. And I'll always be adding free resources on there. So like different types of meditation, loving kindness meditation. So just at least sign up and do the initial meditation. And uh, yeah, that's the website. My email is rishi at meditatewithrishi.com. Uh, but there's a place to book a consultation with me on, on the website. So um, so that's that. And you also have a course, don't you? Mm. Uh, a course. So I do have a course. Yes. Um, so the course is done. And like I teach it as part of the coaching. It's called the Path to Freedom Program, which is, again, basics of spirituality, meditation and the whole and like you can say how to get started with, with spirituality and discovering your own path and learning meditation and forming a practice like a daily practice um so in short becoming a practitioner from a mere dabbler or being someone that's just interested in, in these things yeah that's that's the course oh well thank you for all that information and um just i will put all of the information as well in the show notes at the end so anyone can look into that and follow up um i wanted to okay. comment on that though how it would be hopefully in the future as we all have um fitness instructors for example we will have meditation instructors or coaches because, uh, and this is also something I loved uh, traveling to India and learning from Indian traditions is how in Ayurveda, even at university, you go to university, you study medical, um, you know, medical career and you specialize in Ayurveda, but everyone also has a guru and guru you know the Sanskrit term of relieving the, relieving the heaviness, you know, it, it means heavy or, or dark, but it's like relieving this heavy darkness, relieving and and bringing kind of the light, bringing the answers. The, yep. So I totally agree and believe that if we could all have a guru or we could all have, you know, a wise person that's, as you said, learned from their traditions, but also learned from their own life experience and shares this wisdom um, yes. in terms of a, if you want to call it a therapist or a counselor in the West. But uh, I think this would be very beneficial to people, not just working on the body physically so we look beautiful, uh and also obviously yes. which is very important because it's also important to not just for physical beauty but functioning health obviously wellness and fitness is very key but also so we could look after our mind and our emotions um so very grateful that you came on the podcast today it was lovely to speak to you and connect with you and hopefully we can uh stay connected and maybe have another conversation in the future awesome my my absolute pleasure thank you for having me and i like I, I genuinely, you know, and enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, I know I spoke a lot, but I, I hope that there is some value for, for people who listen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you then. Bye. Okay. All right. Namaste. Namaste. Bye -bye.